let the record reflect we have reconvened virtually with all members present. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the Republic, which stands one nation, under God, indivisible, liberty, and justice for all. I have been having some audio problems to earlier, so hopefully I am working, but people will throw something at me if I'm not. Um, but let's uh, take a uh, moment of silence to recognize two residents that we lost over the last two weeks. Josephine Palma, longtime Madison resident, died in her sleep at the age of 96 on September 27th. She was born in Marstown, May 28, 1924, settled in Madison after a marriage to her husband, late Anthony Palma, on February 8, 1946. She was a waitress at the Morris County Golf Club for 37 years, retired in 86, and she loved her time with her family, loved to cook traditional Italian Sunday meals, and she was fiercely independent and lived on her, in her own home in Madison until the age of 90. She was predeceased by her beloved husband of 46 years uh, in 1992, survived by her son, Patrick, three grandchildren, seven grand great grandchildren. Um, there are, uh, the viewing is tomorrow, the first at, from 4 to 8, the Madison Memorial Home and services on Friday at St. Vincent's at 10 a.m. And Connie Perillo, a lifelong Madison resident, passed away at the age of 87 on uh, September 14th, she was born in Morristown in 1933, raised in Madison, graduate, graduated from Bell Yellard. She uh, played softball in high school. She married her husband, the late Michael Perillo in 1955. And many will know her as a longtime crossing guard on primarily in Ridgedale and Cook. And we're on school days. If you drove down there, you would see her car parked by the apartments. It was her beloved um, red convertible that her husband gave to her and the license plate was for Connie. Uh, and she loved to put a smile on the students' faces by dressing up for all holidays that she crossed. And she adored playing golf and played all the way up until 2016. And for those that do know her, you knew she had a heart of gold and a beautiful soul. Uh, let us take a moment to remember Josephine Palma and Connie Perillo and pass our thoughts on to their families they left behind. Thank you. There are no minutes for approval, so we will move on to our uh, greetings. So welcome everyone. Um, for those that uh, Ended the last meeting virtually. Uh, you may have noticed I had a slightly different background because I was running the meeting remotely. I want to thank uh, Council President Carmela for sitting literally in my seat um, at the last meeting because in case things had uh, gone awry, she was ready to take over the meeting. But uh, thankfully, everything worked fine. This Saturday, as many know, would have been Bottle Hill Day. And it's certainly very disappointing to miss what is not only an incredible day for Madison, but for the thousands of people who come in to our town for the day. So instead of our normal Bottle Hill Day, I encourage all residents to do their own version of Bottle Hill Day by supporting our merchants and great restaurants. And don't forget the nonprofits that support our res residents. They would have been in town raising money so they could serve others. So please think about sending them a donation in their, in their time when their services are so needed, but their resources are so greatly limited. And I think Lisa Ellis is probably listening on the meeting right now. So I asked Lisa to just for full time take, set your alarm for 4 a.m. Saturday morning. And then when it starts ringing, turn it off and go back to sleep. This Saturday, you get to relax. Um, I also uh, want to mention that our Tri Town Care Zoom meeting, this is our uh, group of um, very professionals and clergy and other volunteers and community that are 
meeting on a regular basis to uh, discuss mental health issues during the pandemic. It, it was discussed this week, the importance of kindness and gratitude during the time of stress. And it was pointed out how helping and thanking others can be so uplifting in our own time of need. So I encourage all those that may feel overwhelmed, take a moment to share kindness or gratitude. It will be so uplifting for yourself. And in that vein, on uh, Saturday, October 10th, the First Baptist Church will be hosting a day of prayer to thank all our first responders. This will occur at Cole Park, that's uh, corner of Ridgedale and Fairview, at 2 p.m. So again, that's October 10th. And we have a couple of proclamations to present. I'm going to start with um, our energy efficient day. So we'll add, bring on Ann Huber, who is a member of the uh, Madison Environmental Commission. And we also have Scott Fisher from uh, Seal Energy. Thank you both for joining us. And uh, this is a uh, proclamation declaring October 7th as Energy Efficiency Day. Um, and uh, Scott's got a great little back backdrop there. Thank you. Uh, whereas energy efficiency continues to be the cheapest and quickest and cleanest way to meet our energy needs and reduce utility bills for residential, business, and industrial customers, and whereas energy efficiency can also make our homes and workplaces healthier, safer, and more comfortable, and whereas smarter energy reduce, uses, smarter energy use reduces the amount of electricity we need to power our lives, which helps avoid power plant emissions that can harm health, pollute our air, and warm our climate. And whereas cutting energy waste, uh, cutting energy waste saves U.S. consumers billions of dollars on utility bills every year, up to five hundred dollars per household from from apl uh, appliance efficiency standards alone. And whereas implementing energy efficiency and other clean energy policies and programs can help boost economic opportunities and job creation while continuing to move towards a sustainable future. And whereas the Madison the residents of Madison can continue to contribute our energy efficiency efforts by learning about participating in our home energy audit program with SEAL Power. And whereas a nationwide network of energy efficient groups and partners has designated the first Wednesday in October as the fifth annual Energy Efficiency Day. Now, therefore, I, Robert H. Conley, on behalf of the governing body, hereby proclaim October 7th, 2020, as Energy Efficiency Day. Here's a proclamation. Usually I hand it off and it appears in Anne's hands, but we uh, didn't quite have the energy to do that today, I guess. So, uh, <laughs> Anne, if you have a couple of comments, and then uh, Scott, you can also uh, share what, what Seal Energy does for our residents. Thank you very much, Mayor and Council. It's very nice for you to do this again. I just wanted to report that we took advantage of the audit approximately five years ago, it must have been right around the beginning of its initiation. And then we implemented the recommendations from SEAL audit. And uh, we have enjoyed reduced energy use for the past few years, which we, is reflected in our bills. So I would encourage Madison residents to take advantage of this opportunity. It's a great way to uh, help the environment and help yourself. So that doesn't always you know, work out that way. So in this case, it could. Thank you again, and um, I'll pass the baton on to Scott. I can't see him, but. <laughs> well, thank you for having me on this evening. Um, congratulations on proclaiming Energy Efficiency Day on October 7th. We've been, interestingly enough, Energy Efficiency Day originated around the same time that Madison adopted the Madison Home Energy Assessment Program. This program, provides reduced cost home energy audits to residents of Madison. And for most people, the, re the audit is the first step towards participating in a program that's offered through New Jersey Clean Energy that provides up to $4,000 in cash back incentives and up to $15,000 15, worth of zero or low interest financing to make energy improvements to the home. This has been actually one of our most successful programs to date. I, I'm, I'm not sure how many of you are aware, but in, in 2018, the program actually found itself in a cover story of the real estate section of the New York Times, where uh, a Madison resident, Peter Tashima, who had undergone a home energy audit and had decided to install the retrofit work, 
was interviewed by the Times and had the opportunity to speak about the um, the improvements that he saw in his uh, in his comfort and uh, overall energy reduction. So that was exciting. And then following that. Um, Carmela Vitali, Councilwoman Vitali, had had the work done on her home, and her, both her, myself, and Mayor Conley had the opportunity to speak at the New Jersey League of Municipalities meeting um, back in 2018 about the success of this program. To date, we've done more than 200 energy audits. We've done nearly 40 retrofits in Madison. The program has been a tremendous success. It continues and carries on to this day. Um, it, just because of the 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 tie the natural tie into energy efficiency day, we're we're honored that that Madison proclaimed the day, and we're we're grateful to everybody in Madison uh, who's under who's underwent an audit. We encourage everybody who hasn't. Uh, you can visit our website at c i e l p o w e r dot com forward slash Madison to sign up for one. And if you if you have any questions about the process or if you have if you would like additional information, please call our office at 201-632-3463. Once again, congratulations to everybody on the borough council, Mayor Conley. It's been again one of our most successful programs. I'm grateful to you for the leadership that you've shown in this area. I'm sure many other people are as well. And thank you. Thank you, Scott, and thank you, Ann, for uh, coming in. Um, it's great to reemphasize this program, and as has been pointed out, it uh, makes a, a difference on the individual and the resident. And um, as we face the impact of climate change, um, the more we can do, the better off we are. And one may think about, uh, say, well, what, what would the energy audit for my home do in the overall climate change? I uh, actually came across a quote from the Dalai Lama today, which was, if you think something small does make a difference, Think about a mosquito in your bedroom. Uh, so, so yes, something small can make a big difference. Yes. And and now I'm going to, uh, on that one, uh, step down and present uh, some uh, proclamations in person. Members of the HPC, socially distance apart, we do have masks on. So. So what, um, we have three populations related to uh, historic preservation, and uh, I'm going to read the opening whereas on the first one, but it's, that's consistent with all three, and then the uh, subsequent ones will uh, just read the background, but it's important to uh, understand why we're here and the work of the uh, HPC and the uh, work of our residents to preserve the character or restore the character in some cases of our great community. And this is recognition of 37 Crescent, Crescent Road in Madison. Whereas the Madison Historic Preservation Commission was established in 1993 by number 31 to encourage preservation of sites of historic archeological, cultural, scenic, and archeological significance and to provide arch architectural advice and recommendations on plans submitted for renovations to the facade property of properties not only a short distance but throughout the borough of Madison. And whereas 37 Crescent Road in Madison was constructed in 1893 and is an excellent example of the colonial revival style, the hip roof, palladium window, some symmetrical massing, and the flank on each side are all hallmarks of the original style. Whereas the wooden, wooden siding and windows are intact, adding to the importance of the house of preserving the original materials. The house also retains its traditional setting with the curved driveway and tall trees. Whereas Paul and Kathy Leo, the newest owners, are being commended for keeping the old house as it was, as it, while gently upgrading the systems that needed work. Whereas Leo, the Leos became so interested in their house that they created a full history of the building, 
a valuable record, not only of their own work, but that of the prior ones, all of whom respected this archi archi architectural gem. And that was a very big word. Now, therefore, I, Robert H. Thomas, Mayor of Borough of Madison, on behalf of the governing body, hereby recognize the meticulous preservation of 37 Crescent Road, which contributes the character of the Borough of Madison as a place of beauty and architectural value. As mentioned, John Forte, the proclamation on behalf of the state here. Thank you. And uh, as you can see at home, we have a picture of their home and in this beautiful weather, fall weather, please take a walk down that street. Monica and Scott. Whereas Nine Merle Avenue, the home of the Stebbins family, is a simple vernacular house from the 1870s. And whereas, although Nine Merle Avenue was never a fancy house, it, it had over time, time lost its original porch and gained a series of additions awkwardly attached around the old floor. I remember thinking it was a good friend that lived next door looking at the house as it had grown awkwardly. And whereas Monica and Scott never found a historic, historic photo of the original porch, but they are commended for their sensitive reconstruction of a purely appropriate porch that unifies the original structure and, and the, its later addition and provides a wonderful out, outdoor space for the family. And whereas the Stebbins family used, used an 1870s builder's book as a source for design and found an excellent craftsman, Augustus Lammers, who made the Black stone balusters and that gives the house its period look. And it shows an as an example that uh, even if you don't have the original pictures, you can recreate what was in there. Now, therefore, I, Robert Town, the mayor of Borough Madison, on behalf of the governing body, hereby recognize the renovation of my Borough Latin, which contributes to the character and identity of Borough Madison as a place of beauty and architectural value. Congratulations and thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. And we have one more presentation. This is a little different than some of the others. Um, you never know. You, 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 you see what's on the streets as you go around. You never know what may be lying underneath. So we recently had a uh, major reconstruction, road reconstruction. So here, whereas Joe Beck Contracting of Elizabeth, New Jersey, were working at Highland Avenue and Rosedale Avenue, they uncovered and saved a simple stoneware bottle. And whereas it could have been very easy to crush this bottle on the wheels of heavy equipment to say nothing when it appeared, and it was saying nothing when it appeared. And whereas the contractor's employees took the time to retrieve the bottle, pass it along to assistant borough engineer, recognizing the stonework could be important. And whereas the search by the Madison Historical Society shows the bottle as a rare survivor, a bottle for importing sparkling water from Germany. The travels of this bottle tells us much about the movement of people and goods even in the 19th century. So therefore I, Robert H. Cowling, Mayor Borough Madison, on behalf of the government, government body, hereby recognize John Medeiros, President and Ruben Morin, construction manager to Joe Med for their conscientious regard to historical preservation in the borough. And this was handed off to Historical Society. We have that Dave Luber here. He said, if you want to just set that temporarily for them, we'll hand it off. If you want to tell us where that bottle is now? Uh, the bottle is at the uh, historical uh, local history center at the library, waiting for the library. So there we go. And there's what the municipal tradition is. So this is a great tradition we have to re recognize the efforts of uh, so many people. Um, and I think part of this is not only to thank those that have done the work, but encourage those around the community to think about what Madison means or how we can uh, really preserve that. <laughs> So many people do so much work 
to preserve their homes and their places of business and their places of worship in town. And the Preservation Commission would like to encourage that going forward. It's a discipline with a lot of big words, right? Yes, it is, yes. A lot of big words and a very big idea that we can go forward in the future with tasks to prop it up. So thank you very much for giving your contributions to that. Thank you. Thank you for a concise statement. Thank you. Thank you. We now move on to reports from committees. Finance and Borough Clerk, Council President Vitali. Okay. Can you hear me now? Okay. From the Finance Department, um, this evening uh, you're going to see a report um, by the uh, CFO on the financial impact that the pandemic had on Madison's municipal finances. Um, as you well know, uh, part of our um, municipal uh, budget, we put, uh, set aside $200,000 $200, uh, to help uh, people who were impacted. So this it's going to be in very important information, and I hope that many of the residents get a chance to see um, this report and what has happened. Uh, during, during my years on the council, um, I've actually always fought to make sure that the borough was uh, has strong surplus balances because in times like this i wanted to make sure that the borough was prepared in case of an emergency and again those surplus um, balances really helped us during these last few months so i want to thank my my fellow council members uh, for also supporting this as well we're fortunate to have surplus balances and we need to, uh, them to help us to get through this pa uh, pandemic. So budget season is here already. Um, it's hard to believe that the budget season is, is here. Um, this past week, administration started meeting with the various department heads to review their operating budgets. And this is an important first step in building the budget. Uh, department heads have been asked to keep their budgets flat in, uh, for the 2021 budget. In addition to the operating budget, the administration is working with the borough engineer and department heads on the five-year capital uh, plan. We hope to have a presentation of this important document before the end of the year. Actually, we, we really should all be very proud that we have invested over the past four years $25 million in maintaining and improving our roads, critical in infrastructure and utility assets. So congratulations to the in, uh, engineering department and all the uh, department heads who have taken um, great care of our, uh, our town. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. And now on to uh, public safety, Ms. Bailey. Thank you, Mayor. Um, from the fire department, uh, the fire department has been very busy. Um, they had two structural fires within seven hours of each other. The first fire was on Friday evening, September 18th at 8 p.m. on Del Barton Drive. The homeowner returned um, to find his smoke alarm sounding and his attached garage and house charged with smoke. He called 911. The fire was found to be in the garage and was quickly extinguished. Um, the house did suffer smoke damage and the fire was contained to the garage. Mutual aid came to um, the response to the second alarm fire to assist Madison firefighters and no one, uh, no one was hurt and injured. Then the second fire though occurred several hours after that at three o'clock in the morning on September 19th. Madison fire Fighters were dispatched to a possible working structure fire on Alexander Avenue. The occupants of the 2.5 story residential home were awakened by their smoke alarm sounding and they all got safely out and called 911. Madison firefighters arrived quickly to find that heavy smoke was pushing out the front door and a second alarm was transmitted 
which br again brought mutual aid from the surrounding towns. And the fire appears to have started in the basement and climbed quickly up the interior walls um, of this older style balloon constructed house. And they battled um, the fire on all four levels of the house and it, it took um, quite a long time to get the fire under control, but everybody was safe. The fire was extinguished and they managed to get home around 8.30. But we'd like to thank our fire department, our police department, our um, emergency um, medical vehicles and all the other towns that participated. Um, now from the police department, um, we had another great success story here. On September 26, um, the Madison police officers were dispatched to an Orchard Street residence for the report of an unconscious male when um, the patient was a 61 year old who was performing construction inside the residence. Um, police um, Corporal Bart Glab, Patrolman Chris Burns and Brett Smith arrived on the scene. When they arrived, they observed that both homeowners um, were performing CPR on the man. Turns out that homeowner one was an off-duty Edgewater police officer and, and the spouse was a Morristown emergency room nurse. And the homeowner is advised that the patient was found on the floor with no pulse and he was not breathing. They began CPR. And then um, our officers applied the automated um, external defibr defibrillator and administered a shock and a pulse was regained on the patient. Um, so we want to thank the Madison Ambulance, Fire Department, and Atlantic Health Paramedics. And um, the, the uh, patient was transported to Morristown Memorial. And thank you to the officers who saved him, his life. And then from the police chief, um, I think it's really important that not only, I mean, our emphasis on the, in the police department is community policing. And Chief is very big on training. Um, it's extremely important to have regular training. And he wanted to share with the people of Madison and the council that um, his officers are right now attending a field force civil unrest training so that they are proficient and professional in any deployment situation should the need arise either here in Madison or a mutual aid request from the county. And a component of this training is a refresher on protesters' First Amendment rights, which is sacred to all of us as Americans, um, as Americans, no matter what the content. And um, he feels we are a very well-trained police um, department and New Jersey has very good, um, well-trained departments because we um, practice uh, best practices, not only by the County of Morris, but the New Jersey State Attorney General's office is what we do. And um, we are also an accredited agency. So we are held to certain standards and we are um, follow the best practices of law enforcement under that criteria. And the officers are also required to attend de-escalation training, which is the first step in bringing about a safe resolution if feasible. So I just wanted to pass that on from the chief. Thank you very much, Mayor. Thank you, and thank you for sharing the uh, great work of um, our public safety, both fire and police in the last couple of weeks. Yeah. And uh, public works and engineering, Ms. Byrne. Completed on both Burnett and Glenwell roads as required for NJDOT state aid compliance. AB Construction has continued to make progress on the Dodge Field Playground Building, which is now ready for the construction of the standing seam metal roof. Once the doors are installed and the building perimeter is secure, the final electric and plumbing fixtures can be installed and tested. Construction on Beverly Road and Albright Circle is continuing after an initial late start. The Glenwell Road Project included a new pedestrian crosswalk at Luanica connected to the Geraldo walking path, a continuous trail service along Drew University, repaving an additional trains at Torrey J. Sabatini parking lot and some additional traffic calming methods. On the private side, FDU has begun earthwork on the synthetic turf baseball field. The YMCA is progressing on the building exterior and Pine Acres handicap wrap construction has advanced the last two weeks. DPW uh, 
is uh, we'll be doing pumpkin recycling the weekend after Halloween and the weekend after um, Thanksgiving. You can bring your uh, used pumpkins and they will go into um, the compost pit. From the Madison Environmental Commission, the Association of New Jersey Environmental Commissions awarded an Environmental Achievement Award to the Madison Environmental Commission for their Eco House Tour. This is the third year in a row that Madison has been recognized. This Saturday is the Townwide Garden Sale. See the Madison Environmental Committee page on Rosenet for more information. And finally, Shade Tree Management Board, New Jersey Monthly September 2020 issue looks at how forests and towns in New Jersey face a host of thorny threats. It explores how a few Jersey heroes have come to the aid of the trees and focuses on our very own Jean Krakowia and the Shade Tree Management Board and Friends of the Madison Shade Tree. So please find, read the article. It's really a very good article. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. And Community Affairs, Mr. Hoover. He's muted. Can you hear me? Now we can. Okay, I have a very, very short report tonight from Community Affairs from DDC in conjunction with MACA, the DDC Arts and Events Committee, and Eric Haven are discussing the plans for a potential virtual rendition of the Madison Holiday Arts Festival. From uh, this the Chamber of Commerce, uh, the Scarecrows on Waverly, inst the installation will be on October 22nd and stay until November 2nd. From the Madison Community Arts Center, there's a Red Cross blood drive on October 8th. Madison Mud will present a, mop, a mud pop-up pot shop on October 2nd, 3rd, and 4th. There will be an art exhibition sale at the Art Center. That's it, you Mayor. Thank you. And health, Ms. Cohen. First, a non-COVID-19 update. The health department is finalizing plans for our annual flu clinics that will take place in October. This year, appointments will be required so we can manage the number of people visiting the clinics at any one time. Madison's flu clinics will provide the regular dose quadrivalent valent vaccine appropriate for children and adults six months and older. Our clinics will not provide the high dose vaccine. We anticipate further details will, re will be released by the end of the week. Follow the borough on Facebook or visit rosenet.org later this week for more information. We remain in stage two with no new openings announced since our last meeting and our schools are in their fourth week of instruction. While there have been cases associated with our school communities, we are fortunate that members of the community continue to do the right thing and communicate with the schools and health department quickly regarding COVID concerns. This cooperation and proactive approach has allowed Madison schools to remain open. Our health officer continues to coordinate with Madison School Administration, while our public nursing staff works closely with the school nurses to ensure we maintain a 360 degree view of the situation in our schools. As of today, Madison reports 187 total cases of COVID-19, with 17 cases being reported during the month of September. Eight cases remain open and are still being monitored by the health department. Monitoring of our long-term care facilities, including regular testing, also continues. September certainly has seen an increase in cases locally and throughout the state. However, Morris County's numbers remain overall in a good place. Much of the increase in the statewide numbers can be attributed to localized outbreaks in Ocean, Monmouth, and Middlesex counties in the last seven to 10 days. That said, we should all redouble our efforts to prevent the transmission of COVID-19 by washing our hands, using face coverings, maintaining social distancing, and following other protocols established by places you visit. The list of states and U.S. territories included in New Jersey's travel advisory is now 34. We encourage you to avoid unnecessary travel to these states. Should you travel to a state on the list, please follow the self-quarantine protocol as outlined in the state's travel advisory. Uh, on another non-related, non-COVID related note, um, one of the uh, ordinances on the agenda is to um, address the dog and pet licensing fees. We've added a three-year option which will give you a little bit of savings. Um, if you do that, you can do that the, the year you get um, your pet a rabies shot, and that will all be published as to what those rates are. So look for that and information about how to uh, register your pets. Thanks. Thank you. And utilities, Ms. Ehrlich.
Thank you, Mayor. Uh, from the electric department, the department has completed significant equipment upgrades at Rosedale Manor on Main Street, as well as a pole upgrade uh, at 74 Glen Wild Road. They're also in the process of setting a new pole and overhead wiring for the installation of an electric vehicle uh, charging station at the pool parking lot. They've uh, performed several service calls for partial power and other emergency conditions. Um, and the department is currently assisting with the new underground electrical service feed to the new Dodge Field House that Councilwoman Byrne mentioned. The annual uh, line clearance has been completed in the Barnsdale, Winding Way, and Sinclair Terrace section of town, and crews are now clearing the lines in the Crestview, Lawrence, and Broadview section. From the water department, uh, you may have seen on social media that the Madison Water Department's annual fire hydrant and water main flushing program began this week uh, with the Central Business District and is estimated to last about six weeks. Uh, the department uh, wants us to know that while hydrant flushing typically will not interrupt water service, residents may notice a temporary drop in water pressure while crews are working in the area. There's also the possibility that water may become temporarily discolored, but this is normal and the discolored water does not pose a health hazard. If discolored water occurs, simply run the cold water for a few minutes until it clears. The water department also reports that they repaired two six inch water main valves on Hamilton Street and Valley Road. And that is all for utilities. Thank you. Communications and petitions. Uh, none received, Mayor. Okay, we are now on to our first of invitations for discussion from the public. As a reminder, uh, this is one is limited to items on our agenda discussion and resolutions. So I will go through those items shortly that you can comment on. If you want to comment on any other topic, I have to wait for the next uh, period, which will be after our uh, for hearing. Um, the uh, topics you can comment on on our agenda discussion is our little diverse um, library presentation from the Girl Scouts. We have, uh, as, as mentioned in uh, Council President Vitali's report, the COVID-19 financial impact report. We have added to agenda discussion resolution 245, which is the purchase of police shield. So you can comment on those items, or you can comment on these resolutions, which will be part of the consent agenda, which will be uh, approved at the end of the meeting. So you will know what's in that consent agenda also. Resolution 236, author authorized in contract with the County of Mars to provide emergency 911 dispatch services at a rate of 25,000 per year. This is through um, January, 2019 through uh, 2020. Uh, resolution 237, uh, authorized an appointment of Detective Kenneth Shannon as Sergeant in the Madison Police Department effective tomorrow. Resolution 238, appointment of Corporal Sean McCarthy as Sergeant in the Madison Police Department effective October 1st also. Resolution 239, authorized in Girl Scout Silver Award Project at the Museum of Early Trade, which we'll be hearing about shortly. Resolution 240, authorizing release of restoration bond to Millennium Development Group, LLC, for 286 Kings Road Block 5201, Lot 11. Resolution 241 is um, authorizing the uh, application for strategic plan Minis uh, Madison Municipal Alliance, known as MASA, for fiscal year 2021, and this is for a grant of $5,050. There's a cash match of 1,262 and in-kind match of 3,787. Resolution 242, authorizing up to $2,250 open space trust funds for the forest, forestry mowing at the Madison Recreation Center, and this is uh, funded through Ordinance 21-2019. Resolution 243 is renewing liquor licenses for um, 2020-2021 for La Agria, Bottle Hill Tavern, and Shanghai Jazz. 244, renewal agreement with the Employment Assistance Program with Atlantic Health System. Resolution 245, awarding contract for the purchase of 12 protective shields for the police department, as mentioned, this will be discussed shortly and that this will be um, voted on separately after the discussion. 
Resolution 246 is authorizing the annual Rotary Christmas tree sale at Dodge Field from November 25th through December 23rd. And Resolution 247 is opposing Assembly Bill A111, which is uh, re reinstating prior property tax exemptions for nonprofit hospitals with on site for profit medical providers. So, this is um, trying to protect the fact that we collect pr property taxes from for profit operations, even if they have partnership with a nonprofit. Uh, resolution 248 is a special events permit to allow the use of Summerhill Park by Boy Scouts, Patriots Group 7 for camping events on various dates. Resolution 249, resolution authorizing the use of the community pool public parking lot by Morris Elite Soccer Club on um, October 17th um, and 18th for a uh, soccer equipment swap. So those are part of the res the uh, agenda, the consent agenda. You can comment on any of those items. If you wish to comment on those items, you may raise your hand by clicking the hand. If you're online, if you're on the phone, you hit star nine. Once you are recognized, you must first state your name and your address. A failure to do so may result in you being cut off. The second thing you must state is the resolution that you're addressing or the agenda item. And if you want to address something else, you have to wait a little bit later in the meeting. Anyone wishing to comment, please raise your hand now. Okay, Tom Howard Potus. Bring. Welcome, Tom. Uh, hello, Mayor. Hello, everybody. Hello, fellow council people. How are you guys? Good. Good. Nice. Nice to see you all here or wherever you are. Um, real quick. Uh, we, 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 even though we know who you are, say your name and address, oh, please. Sorry, sir. Thomas Harold Lamputis, 27 Pomeroy Road in Madison. All right, and the uh, agenda item you're commenting on. Go ahead and go uh, ahead. So first, I just want to comment. I guess we're going to hear a presentation, maybe from Jim, on the COVID-19 financial impact report. Yes. That would um, maybe present uh, some uh, alterations to the budget and how we might have some planning for our, our town projects that were budgeted pre-COVID. But I'll wait to hear from that, that presentation. The other thing I wanted to comment on is Ordinance 33-2020 about the uh, increase of building permits and fees. Is there is there a guideline of how much you're going up? Is it for specific types of building permits? Uh, is it just a percentage across the board for everything that goes through the office? I, uh, Tom, I apologize. I should have mentioned in the opening comments, Ordinance 33 has been withdrawn. Oh. So um, okay. that we will, uh, if it comes back, we'll, we'll know to uh, give you some information on that. All right, give me back my 20 seconds. That's, yep. Okay. Then uh, how about Ordinance uh, 35-2020, um, uh, appropriating $150,000 to the affordable housing uh, new development on 7 Elm. I just wanted to comment that I'm happy that the borough is participating. It's going to be a, a nice project. I'm on the HQM board and uh, we've been working on that building and I know the boroughs cooperated too to help us. So I think that'll add a couple of nice affordable housing units to our, uh, our, our uh, requirement for the state. The last thing that I'm going to comment on mayor, oh, two things really quick. So the, the renewal of the liquor licenses, I, I guess I can comment that since I'm one of the three uh, owners in the borough who are renewing their liquor licenses, I had hoped that the borough would be a little sensitive to the fact that for six months, we really didn't have a bar and so practically no, no liquor compared to uh, normal times. Um, we did pay the fee so that we can continue to operate now the, the, the limited bar activity that we have. but. Uh, you know, the borough has been very sensitive this whole uh, COVID period to the residents in town, um, the uh, the commercial tenants in town to have some grant money. So I was just thinking that maybe this is a place also where the borough would have reconsidered the full annual fee to compromise it. And the, the three businesses who renewed, all of us 
who were under the same duress for um, for that six month period. So it was just just an observation. I don't know if you can amend it. I hope you can give some consideration to it. If there's any changes moving forward, please. And the last thing, I guess I can comment on 246-2020. Yep, and you've got one minute left. Okay, well, this could take a minute, right, to comment yep. on the fact that we're going to, the Madison Rotary is going to um, have their second annual Christmas tree sale. Uh, all of the proceeds that are raised from this Christmas tree sale are uh, distributed through the Madison Rotary to primarily uh, borough, um, borough needs. We also do some things for Rotary International. Uh, I think we raised about $14,000 last year, but Mary, you can, you can correct that if I'm off by much, but somewhere in that neighborhood. And um, it's a service that was available before at the YMCA. And now there, besides uh, J&M, there's nowhere else in town that sells Christmas trees. So I think this was a, a replacement of what the YMCA offered the community for three decades. And, uh, and, and, and I'm glad that we could all participate at the Rotary level to uh, have this community fundraiser and give the money back to the borough. And I hope it doesn't come too soon, Mayor. I'm not in a rush for the winter to start and start selling trees. Thank you. All right. And you, um... I, I added some time on you. Um, you 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 fit it all in. So um, uh, re related to liquor licenses, there were several that were re uh, approved at the prior meeting. So all the consumption licenses, I think, have been uh, approved at this point. But uh, we will uh, take your uh, comments in consideration. And again, the um, as you said about the tree sale, uh, though I'm directly involved with that, but as Rotary, we do not directly benefit. It, it is a, a great program for the, the town. So thank you for all your comments. And um, we will now, uh, there are no other people, no other comments, so we will move on to um, our items for discussion. And um, the agenda rec came from uh, John with, uh, as liaison to the museum, but uh, Deb Cohen has been working closely with the scouts. So I'll ask Deb to introduce our scouts and uh, they will, they're gonna do, our, do their presentation. So um, Libby and Charlotte Nebres are Girl Scouts who are going for their silver award. Um, and they took up the little free library and I'm gonna let them fully explain and turned it into a little free diversity library. Um, so they worked on it, they did a donation drive. I'm gonna let them talk about what they did, but they did a great job and um, I was pleased to be able to work with them. Go ahead, girls. Okay, hello, I am Libby Nebris and this is my sister, Charlotte Nebris. Uh, we're here tonight to present our Girl Scout Silver Award project. So our project is called the Little Diverse Library, and it's our mission to support diversity and inclusion in our town. So since there's been increased interest in uplifting people of color and sharing their experiences, we wanted to make books featuring diverse authors and characters more accessible. Um, so we had the honor to present this idea at a community conversation meeting over the summer and we spoke to some of the borough council uh, members and Mayor Bob. Uh, we are very happy to receive such support for this project. And one of the most rewarding experiences for us was to see the community organizing in action. Um, so we got support from the town, the Museum of Early Trades and Crafts and local elementary schools. And that made it possible for us to bring this beautiful lending library of books, diverse books to Madison. Uh, so we held book donation drives at each of the local elementary schools and at Hartley Dodge last week, and we collected over 50 books. Um, we're happy to hear that the Museum of Early Traps would provide a home for our little library, and it's fitting because the museum was actually the first library in Madison. Um, but we want to thank everyone for supporting this little diverse library project. Um, diverse representation in children's books we think is very important. And we hope that the Little Diverse Library will be uplifting and make books featuring diverse authors and characters more accessible to everyone. Thanks, girls. It was, you did a great job. And I do also want to do a quick shout out to DPW. We tried to install the Little Library by ourselves. Yeah. Um, and luckily, Libby and Charlotte's dad is handy and was able to rig something up for the actual event. But they have since, as of today, it is in the ground the way it's supposed to be a nice, sturdy, um, structure. So go read some books, drop some off, do kind of a little lending library sort of thing. And thanks for bringing it to Madison, girls. Thank you. 
let me and Charlotte awesome. to reinforce awesome. that. Um, and then we'll, any other comments we'll get in a second. I, I just want to thank you. You know, the, the little library concept has been around for a few years and there's a few around town. See them all over the country. It's such a great concept, but to, to bring it to this level was a great idea. And I, I not only uh, is this a great project that uh, you have certainly earned your award. Um, I think make sure you make note of the fact that you had to present to a governing body and learn something about government red tape, that things don't move normally as quickly as we'd, we'd love to. So I appreciate your patience and all your work on this. Uh, and great work with you. Any other comments from our council members? All right. Well, thank you. This will be, uh, or come out, Carmela. Yeah, yeah I, I just, I, you're, you're two absolutely awesome people. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I, I like the concept. Uh, there's one across the way from me at the Kirby Center. Yes. And uh, about three years ago, a young man decided with his dad that he was going to do the same thing. So there's one over on South Street in front of his house. And um, every time I go by those two, people are actually in there and taking them out. So you have a great spot because there's lots of people that, uh, you know, are walking in that area and whatever. But, uh, you know, congratulations on doing a wonderful job. You two are awesome. Yep. Thank you so much. And so this is uh, Re resolution 239, which will be cons on our consent agenda, which means at the end of the meeting, we will be approving this. And then I will sign it and we will get a uh, signed copy to you so you can uh, know that uh, it has been approved and you can add that to your file on the overall project. Again, again congratulations. Thank you so much. All right, take care. All right, COVID-19 financial impact report. CFO, Jim Burnett. Thank you, Mayor. That's a uh, tough act to follow. Um, <laughs> Libby and her sister were that, that extremely, is, um, extremely <laughs> impressive. <laughs> extremely impressive. Uh, thank you. I want to appreciate, I want to thank the council for the opportunity to present. I want to take a few minutes to talk about the pandemic and its impact that it's had on municipal finances. I'm going to pull up a presentation here. Uh, bear with me here. Uh, hold on one second. Figure out how to pull it up. Screen. I apologize. I think we need to minimize this screen here. Show all windows. I think I need to shut a few windows down first, Mayor. I apologize for the delay. That's all um, right. Now we'll send Ray in to help you. No, no, no. <laughs> That's terrible. Too many screens open and I'm struggling to find the one PDF screen that I have open and ready. So hopefully I have done the trick here. Wow, still don't have it here. Here we go. Goodness gracious. Okay. Excuse, apologize for the technical difficulties. So uh, the pandemic has had a significant impact on the borough's financial position, as one can imagine. Um, this report's going to discuss the performance uh, of the financial performance during the pandemic. It'll summarize the municipal response. Uh, Administration is continuing to track and monitor financial performance in a number of areas, including tax collection rate, utility revenue, other municipal revenues and pandemic related expenses. The headline, uh, one of the headlines is that we anticipate revenues to drop up to $1.2 million in 2020 between municipal and utility uh, operating accounts due to the pandemic. Uh, tax collection rate is one of the areas that Carmela, uh, Councilwoman Vitali has uh, presented and discussed at various council meetings. We monitor this, it's obviously how much of the total property taxes bills that we've issued, how much has actually been collected. Fortunately, we have seen a good collection rate. This table here shows that our collection rate for the second quarter of each year and of 2020 is pretty similar to what we had in 2019, 18, and 17. Same with third quarter tax collection. We did have uh, an extension of the third quarter deadline due to the delay in county certification. So. Uh, there was a little bit of a delay there, but uh, you can see that we've collected the vast majority of our property tax. And a lot of that comes in from escrow agents. Residents with mortgages typically have property taxes that are escrowed 
with their monthly mortgage payment, these property taxes are aggregated and paid directly to the borough by these escrow agents. There are three primary agents and they pay approximately 46% of the total quarterly tax bills that we receive. We receive in lump sums from these agents. So uh, the fact that they're collecting the property taxes and uh, sending them to us and there hasn't been any delay is a major, uh, major reason why our tax collection rate hasn't dropped. Tax collection is typically, in, in economic terms, a lagging indicator of the economy. We may not see a reduction in tax collection until well into a recession. Uh, if the economy continues to struggle, the tax collection rate could be an issue, but fortunately right now, we're in good shape. Shifting to utility revenue, uh, we have a table here that shows the relative billings for water and electric for 2018, 2019, and 2020. Obviously, weather has a significant impact. Uh, it was a very warm and dry summer, so people were watering their lawns more. Last year was a wet summer. So as you can see, water billing for uh, the years, year to date in 2020 versus year to date in 2019, so that's January 1 to September 26th when we calculated these figures. Uh, water's actually, consumption's actually up a little bit. Electric residential, as you can see, is up significantly. And I don't know if you can see my pointer here or not, um, but uh, electric revenue for residential, electric billing for residential is up uh, almost $550,000. Uh, it does go up and down again, depending on the weather. Um, the big surprise, not surprise, but the big difference and concern is the commercial and institutional. The university is shut down, the schools were shut down for April, May, and June. Uh, the corporations, the offices, Allergan, Realogy are basically empty. So you see a very significant drop in the commercial and industrial or institutional uh, electric customers that we have. So in total, these two numbers here, 2019 to 2020 is down $308,000. That's year to date. We anticipate that uh, that will continue to grow throughout the rest of the year because Drew is on virtual and 100% virtual and there are very few students there and none of the corporations are talking about bringing their employees back. So we anticipate this $300,000 number to grow to close to $500,000 over the course of the year. In addition, we have the outstanding bills that residents um, have not paid. And every day we have outstanding bills. We issued bills two days ago. They're outstanding. We haven't gotten paid for them yet. We typically have about $1.7 million at any particular time in outstanding bills. Right now, we're seeing closer to $2.1 million in outstanding bills. So that's a $250,000 difference. What does that mean? People are slowing down and delaying the payment of their electric bills and their water utility bills, which makes sense because it's a challenging economic time. So the combination of, of, these, of these numbers dropping um, over the course of the year to 500,000 plus that delay in outstanding bills uh, gives us uh, firm comfort in saying that our total revenue for utilities, I should say uh, electric utility, is gonna be down by 700,000 by year end. So, uh, I don't know if there have any questions. I can certainly go through all this and then we can um, do questions afterwards, Mayor, whichever you prefer. Well, uh, unless there's a bigger questions on this page, we you know, keep on moving and then we'll after the discussion at the end. Yes, sir. So we look at other municipal revenues. The municipal budget includes revenue from taxes and revenue from surplus and revenue from the electric utility and water utility that's transferred in. And it includes other revenues, such as licenses, permits, interest on delinquent taxes, we have cable franchise fee, we have cell tower leases on the water tower and on the tower over by uh, on King's Road, construction permit fees. All of those revenues were actually fairly in line from 2019 to 2020. Construction slowed down significantly in March and April, but as most people know, it's really ramped up now and is um, quite busy in town with construction. So we don't see a huge difference, fingers crossed, in those revenues. But there are three revenues that are down significantly. The first is uh, on the table here, municipal court fines and fees. And that's down $58,000 for the year. Obviously the court was basically shut, but 
so was the issuance of tickets and the issuance of parking and all the other fines and fees that would be collected uh, during that time frame. And it's still slow. So we have a difference of $58,000 now. We anticipate that going up to $90,000. This was uh, only through August on the revenue. So we anticipate that being up to $90,000 by year end. Commuter daily parking, obviously there's not a lot of people going to New York City. So we have daily parking revenue that comes in. At this point in time last year, it was close to $62,000. We had a fair amount coming in January, February, and March, and it's pretty much dropped off a cliff. I think we got like $50 last month in, or two months ago in the revenues. So we anticipate that revenue to be down for the year, $47,000. The third is interest on bank balances. That's the interest rate that we earn on balances. We invest it with the New Jersey Cash Management Fund, uh, our banks or CBs uh, and what have you. But uh, the interest rates dropped significantly since uh, March. Uh, at the beginning of the year was a 2%. Last year was a 2% for a good part of the year. Now it's at 0.2%. So the amount of revenue that we're earning on our bank balances um, this year so far is 107,000. Last year it was 300,000. We anticipate that for the total year that we will be down $300,000 in revenues. So if you add all these lines up uh, we th and and make an assumption that maybe these license fees and permits and delinquent taxes and things like that'll be down about 50,000. We see a total of about uh, five, uh, about 500,000 lost revenue from municipal, from municipal revenues. So earlier I talked about 700,000 in utility revenues, now talking about 500,000 in lost municipal revenues. That's where uh, we're getting, Ray and I have come up with this estimate of $1.2 million for revenues being down. One thing to keep in mind, and it's something that um, we'll have to have some discussions on, do we, do we even issue, I don't think that that's a reason to have a conversation about this tonight, but Mayor, I know you and I have talked about this with Lisa Ellis, the annual parking permits um, for residents going to New York City. Will, will they even buy them now? Um, how will that work? That generates $200,000 in revenue to the borough in November and December. So the $1.2 million could be $1.4 million if we decide to change what we're doing with those permits, or if we decide to just go ahead and, uh, and, and issue the permits and see if the residents purchase them and they choose not to. So uh, that's one other thing to keep in mind. Hey, what's going on here? Let's see if I can get this to work. Um, concerns oh, Deb, for- Deb, you had a question oh, on that page? Sorry. Un unmute. Just a quick question on the, the parking. Um, and now it went, this is, this is twice I've done this, Bob. I, it was a question on the parking permits and I don't remember what it was. So I'll throw but, it in chat or a text if I think of it. Well, what, what, what are the conversations, just so we, and we'll be coming back to the council probably with a resolution of the conversation we've been having. You know, for the most part, commuters have not used the parking lots since March. They will probably not use the uh, parking lots uh, much next year is the fact that, you know, to, to offer as a, uh, not quite a um, rebate, but, you know, a, a credit towards their 2021 um, permits of 50%. So, and, but we will also have the um, idea of doing a survey to the commuters just to get an idea of, you know, when do they think they're going back to work? And, um, and the other, Big question is is when they go back to work is how often will they actually be in the office that uh, you know this new model will most likely be uh, at uh, 50 percent of the uh, population in the offices and so those are all sorts of things that we will we'll need to know and that we'll be coming back with that. Jim I remembered what it was when would we have to make a decision on the permits I'm blaming COVID brain and too much going on um, is that something that can be done at any time or is it something that has to be done by resolution if we decide we don't want to either do them or we want to change them how does that work that's a good question I think it should be at the next council meeting at the next council meeting or the one in October or the one of the two October council meetings uh, if that decision is made because um, it, it would be helpful that council collectively determined and decided to make a decision. So Ray and I will work with Lisa on some potential proposals and bring them back to you in October on what we should do. And 
and certainly recognizing that no matter what the decision is, there's going to be a hit. You know, we can't say, oh, we're not going to change, we're not going to do any sort of credit. Uh, no, it's not, not going to maintain the uh, level. Carmela? Yeah. Um, I'm just thinking um, about uh, coordinating some of this with the uh, boxcar. I mean, they, they certainly seem to have a handle on what is going on. They're in, in a lot of municipalities that are probably dealing with the same exact thing. Um, and I, I had a brief conversation with Jim today. Uh, the, the model, people going back to work model is completely different. Uh, case in point, like my daughter-in-law, her company is not going to go back at all. So she'll be working from home. Um, and um, so I'm just wondering if Boxcar can kind of help as well, because they have really, um, you know, they, they have a good feel for what has been going on. And you have to understand what their anticipation is too, because they, they, they have played a major part um, in all of this for us. And, and just the, a thought. Just yeah, a thought. No, it's, it's a good point. Good, and, and we've had some conversations, you know, we, uh, as Lisa knows, we spent a, and Jim knows, we spent a lot of time on talking about uh, kind of revamping the uh, parking and doing the, the deli parking, that we now, which we now do through, through Boxcar, and then making some of the uh, permit spots available after a certain, a certain time of the day. All that is out the window. So we, I, I think we're going to have a, uh, a whole different uh, version of the, the, the permits and a greatly expanded deli parking. Um, Mm -hmm. And not just for commuters, but maybe more so for, you know, that the use of the parking lots um, may forever be more oriented towards supporting our downtown as opposed to commuting if, if the, you know, change of work style is permanent. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so concerns for 2021 and beyond. The way the court billings work with our shared service revenue from our uh, partner towns, um, we typically won't see a hit on our revenue or um, the fees that we receive from them until 2021 or beyond. Uh, we receive uh, $1,288 per court session for each town. We didn't have a number of sessions uh, during uh, the time when COVID was uh, in March and April when it was problematic. And so that's certainly going to be a reduction and that, that gets reflected in next year's bills when we have uh, a reduction in court sessions this year. So revenues from that source in 2021 are going to be down. It's just a question of how much. Other revenues, um, the lack of revenue from interest parking and court uh, that we talked about at the previous slide, they're structural. In other words, they're probably not going to bounce back in 2021. So there will be a question of how do we make up that revenue within the budget. In terms of the budget, state statute requires that budgeted revenues in the current year cannot exceed the actual revenues from the prior year. So last year we had $475,000 in interest income. In 2019 and 2020, we anticipated in our budget over $400,000 in interest. We're only gonna have $150,000 in interest. So our budget, we will have, that, that creates a budget hole and we'll have to fill that and find other sources of revenue um, or other ways to trim costs to resolve that issue. The office market um, will remain weak for most of 2021. Will it bounce back? This is gonna be a longer term systemic issue, but we're going to have more than likely have uh, property tax. Uh, we're gonna have offices that are gonna be disputing their property taxes and revenue from the property taxes and from the utilities will continue to drop with the offices being empty. Where will we make up that revenue? Uh, delinquencies, we will monitor that. Uh, we'll see where that goes. And, and right now, to be honest with you, some people say it's a V, some people say it's a K. I don't even really know what that means. We don't really know what's going to happen with the economy. Is it going to be a long-term downturn or not? So as a CFO, I want to prepare council and prepare the borough financially so we can absorb a longer-term economic downturn. So with that, I wanna reiterate what Councilwoman Vitale said, that uh, we are very fortunate that we were in a good position and that the governing body made sure that we had a strong surplus position before the pandemic. There were a lot of people who were saying, reduce the surplus, reduce the surplus. I appreciate the governing body uh, being cautious in that regard. 
Um, we have surplus for the unknown and this pandemic was clearly an unknown situation. And I uh, think Madison has uh, been very well served by the decisions of this council and prior councils to maintain surplus balances. The question is what can we do in 2021 and beyond to resolve this 1.2 revenue shortfall? We can reduce the amount of capital that we, uh, the projects that we do. Last year, or 2018, we had $3.8 million that came out of the municipal operating budget and use, it was used to fund capital in municipal capital, roads, fire trucks, um, sewer uh, improvements and alike. We dropped that to 3.5 million in 2020. We may have to drop that again in 2021. Reduce it, I should say. Spending, we should continue to look for efficiencies and savings. We have to do that. It's, it's our, our fiduciary responsibility. Um, we, administration does recommend a moderate tax increase next year. I, I would not advocate for a 0% tax increase in 2021. We need to have some revenues increase with so many other revenues decreasing. The dividend for the electric utility, one option is to consider reducing the electric utility dividend back to $1.5 million. Use of surplus. This is definitely going to be one of the cushions that we use in 2021. And uh, we've talked about that back in April that, that there will be a glide path of sorts and that using, use of surplus will increase. And it's important to note that you don't use surplus to buy groceries. It's like you don't buy, you don't buy groceries with your retirement savings. So surplus in the budget, you don't wanna be over reliant on it. Um, but the surplus flight path, um, we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, the final consideration is the possibility of a water rate increase. We have talked about it. Our water rates are 40% lower than surrounding communities, and uh, it would certainly encourage um, conservation, and it would, uh, it's a potential lever that could be used to increase revenues. These are the two surplus charts that I presented back in April, the hopeful scenario and the less optimal scenario. <laughs> And uh, this is the flight path that I'm talking about. Are we going to level off here or are we going to kind of crash down as we had in the 2022 and 2023? And the bottom line is um, time will tell. I'm, you know, we don't make it a, uh, we don't calculate surplus, anticipated surplus on a monthly basis because there's so many things that change. We just talked about $200,000 in permit fees um, for commuter parking permits not coming until November, December. So it's, it, we do this once a year. We'll do this again in January, February. We'll have conversations with council. We'll we'll moder we'll uh, we'll um, uh, mon uh, we'll monitor the surplus and make a determination um, with council what we think the best course of action is for use of surplus in the future. So I didn't want to be all doom and gloom. So I did want to highlight some of the great response that the borough has done during uh, the global pandemic. Um, I want to thank the governing body for having a forethought for appropriating $200,000 in additional funds in the budget. That single budget line, a single budget line was created and we have used, um, used it for pandemic related expenses, including um, hand sanitizers, detectors, masks, thermal, thermal detectors that we have here in Hartley Dodge, um, personal protective equipment, uh, parking barriers for restaurants. I'm sure you've seen them additional computer hardware that allowed for staff to work from home and other technology expenses like uh, the upgraded Zoom video conferencing account that we're using now. In terms of operations, uh, I, I'm very proud of how uh, administration and the department heads and the staff responded very quickly during unprecedented times. The health department and public health nursing staff have been heroic in their frontline work in contract tracing, state reporting, and help supporting the town. Um, with the health department uh, help, our first responders develop new protocols that we never thought we'd have to do, but now have to do with the pandemic. Our purchasing department found personal protective equipment and were able to acquire it quickly for staff and responders. Um, our staff, borough staff split into teams and worked part at home and part at uh, here in the office during, from March until May. Um, HDM remained open with special window drop off at all times. Um, and uh, in uh, May, 30, May 22nd, all staff came back um, at the end of May and we're working here with uh, safe uh, social distancing measures. August 31st, the building was opened where uh, residents 
and customers could come into the building after meeting a, a greeter that would pre-screen them for temperature, mask, and other information. And uh, the rural buildings continue to have advanced cleaning, and fortunately we have not had any issues in the building. Many towns haven't opened yet, and, and we're open to the public. We consider all of our staff to be essential and the work we do to be essential. From a public standpoint, uh, the mayor and council know this, but I think it's important to highlight that the borough extended second quarter property tax deadlines, interest and penalties were waived on utility charges. There was a significant electric rebate offered to furlough one unemployed employees. There was a $400 electric rebate that was offered to downtown businesses. Um, one of the most impressive uh, items was that what the downtown development Commission did with Lisa Ellis and the Madison Main Street Foundation raising $190,000, um, which uh, gave small business recovery grants of up to $4,300 to um, our local businesses. We've also had, um, thanks to tremendous staff um, and volunteer help, extensive communication with the residents. Um, here's just a snippet of one of our uh, Facebook posts. Um, it's important to keep the residents informed during the pandemic. Uh, all the committees and commissions have been functioning and working virtually and continuing their good work. Munici certain municipal codes were suspended to allow businesses to have special pick up and drop off in parking spots. Municipal codes were suspended to allow residents to expand outdoor dining like the photo we have here. And the borough purchased um, parking barriers um, to further expand the outdoor dining experience and help the residents and help the businesses. So I think uh, the, the borough's response the governing body's response, the staff's response um, to this unprecedented time has been just impressive. So I wanted to highlight that. Uh, with that, I'll obviously take any questions. Thank you, Jim, for good, great presentation. And uh, just to reinforce uh, a couple of things you said. One, uh, commend the uh, governing body and our staff to be uh, one on the sunny days working so hard so we could deal with this. Uh, Really, very rainy time um, that uh, we were in a good position to do it. And um, I think it, you, you mentioned it, but I don't want people to miss the fact that uh, we basically never shut down operations in the borough of Madison. Um, I would guess out of the 565 communities in the state, maybe 560 did. Uh, so, uh, I, you know, we are essential and we provided those services all through that. Um, and the support to the downtown and all our residents was uh, great. Any questions or comments? All right, th thank you. And we'll um, continue to look at, uh, you know, the, the comments that um, Tom made as far as support to our uh, downtown and to our residents. I think we will, as we, we look at the low utilities and the um, 2021 budget as to what other things that we can do to help support and shore up our businesses. All right, with that we will um, move on to uh, next discussion item, Police Shields. Our uh, Chair for Public Safety, uh, Ostry, you wanna lead this off please? Sure. Um, uh what we're asking tonight is to fund the rest of the defensive equipment that the chief of police um, has requested and actually put in his capital budget for this year. Um, at the last council meeting, we passed, um, approved um, the purchase of some of the defensive equipment and um, we had some questions regarding the shields which I feel the chief has answered and he is here to take any questions. Um, but they are defensive, um, they're defensive pieces of equipment and he's asking for 12 shields, one for each uh, to equip in each car. And they are very versatile. Um, they can be used for crowd control. They can also be used to protect the officers at, at time of um, when, if there's an unruly dog or something. Um, so it is a defensive piece of equipment. It's not an offensive piece of equipment and it helps to, um, in their means of their goal to deescalate situations. And Chief, do you have anything more to add? 
No, I just want to thank you all for your consideration. Uh, I know I've been in front of council a couple times already uh, with this matter. Um, you know, I feel I have an obligation to uh, protect my officers and um, I view these shields just like I said in the past as, uh, you know, any other type of protective equipment, uh, whether it be turnout gear for firemen, um, bulletproof vests, things of that nature. Um, we owe it to our officers to, to protect them so they can protect the citizens of our community. Um, uh, it's, I just feel we have an obligation as a community to protect our officers. Thank you, Chief. And um, in the resolution, so the public understands it, is the um, clarification that, uh, as um, uh, Austri mentioned, that uh, if we are ordering 12, so there is one for each vehicle, that um, the this is not only equipping, equipping our officers, but also making sure they have the training to properly use and also properly to react to any issues that, that may happen. We, you heard some of that in Austria's report early in the meeting. Um, one of the things, and, and this is to recognize the, the, the world we currently live in. This is in other years, this would have remained on the consent agenda, but we feel it's very important for the, the public to understand exactly what we're doing uh with our uh public safety and how we're serving our residents um you know one way i view it is um it's a goal of this governing body and it's a goal of our chief and all our police officers that proudly wear the uniform on a, a daily basis to protect life on both sides of the shield it's you know and what is difficult in this time is many of us have the image of shields being offensively um and this is certainly not what the intent is. These, these are to protect our officers. They go out there every day to serve our residents, to keep them safe. And uh, we owe it to everyone, as I said, on both sides of the shield that we keep them safe. Other comments, and uh, Deb, and then uh, Carmela. I just wanna thank Chief Dacus, and he and I had a good conversation earlier today about this, because I, I, I struggled with it. Um, I, you know, it's, it's one of those things that you know, I don't like how they're being used, like Bob said, Mayor said, um, offensively. Um, and in talking to him, and he sent me photos of the shields um, uh, so I could see what they were, and they're not what I had in my head. Of, I think you said they were the ballistic shields is what I was thinking of, and these are definitely much um, less, for lack of a better term, not less for protection, but less in, in their um, intensity. I think the, the one thing, the training you do, and we, we approve training all the time, but I think with maybe regards specifically to this or any of the training you guys do are doing, I know you're doing a lot right now with the, how to deal with the protests and how to deal with, you know, big groups and what happens if, and that sort of thing. If it's possible to get a half page or one page kind of, hey, this is what we learned at this training so that, you know, we can see as they're going on, the ongoing training that's happening and kind of what, de-escalation techniques they're learning or whatever i mean we don't need you know every minute detail obviously but i think it would help reinforce that the, the proper training is being given so that they know how to do everything they can so that they really are just a defense if they're if they're having to do that and they're not being used um the way we're seeing them in some of the major cities that are you know and minor cities but that are causing problems so i think that's my only request is you know, something to show how the training's ongoing and that it's not they're getting training now. And I know you don't typically do this at, with anything, you know, and then they don't get training for another two years on it because the training and the techniques might be changing and the information changes and that sort of thing. Yeah, a lot of this training is also, it's ma also, it's yearly mandated by the Attorney General's office. So a lot of these things, um, it, it's not just uh, arbitrary through the department. These are mandatory things that all officers in the state of New Jersey have to go through. Uh, de-escalation is one of them um, like i said use of force so these are things that that we do on on a yearly basis but just to reinforce concepts thank you chief and i think it is important as uh, deb mentioned that, that we share that with the public because we do a great job with the training and we, we need to let people know that carmela and i think uh, maureen i think i saw your hand there. you did you want me to go first yeah. I yes you, you're you you are you are first carmela and then Oh, thank you. Thank you. Anyway, um, you know, Chief, uh, we've talked a lot over the years about community policing, and this is what we have um, 
always recognized here. Um, I, I don't think by ordering a shield and carrying it in a car is going to change uh, that concept at all. I, I really believe that um, when we hire new policemen, they understand that uh, the concept of uh, community uh, policing and that will continue. So I, I've, I've been in favor of the shields right along. Um, you know, I know a lot of these guys, um, a lot of them have families. Um, I don't want them to be hurt either. And I think it's the responsibility of each one of us is in, in we are protecting our residents, but we have to protect the people who work for us to keep us safe. So, um, you know, I, I think that uh, I, I don't have a fear that we will be using them offensively. I think that um, maybe we'll never use them. You know, if God is willing, maybe we'll never use them. But just in the event, um, you know, I'm happy to see that they are here. And I've always thought that they've been part of what we used to order and, and keep on hand anyway. Am I correct? I mean, yeah, we... Uh we yeah. currently we, we currently have four shields, but they're okay. ballistic type. Okay, okay, but that's uh, so. I just wanted to tell you that you know um, you know uh, keep the guys safe. Very important for us. That's definitely a high priority for me. Yeah. Uh, Maureen. Well, as as Carmela said, you know, the culture in in Madison is community community policing and 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 interacting the police. You know, you live and you work. Everybody is part of the community here in Madison, and we we have a <clears throat> um, we have an understanding that we we're here that we're here for the police, and the police are here for us. So, you know, God forbid we should ever be in this. Just yeah, just God forbid we ever were in a position where we had to use this. Hopefully the, the training and, and everything will never be in that position. Right. Thank you. Any other uh, comments? Okay. Uh, uh, Rachel. Hi, Chief. Thanks for joining us yet again. Thank you. It's been great to be in dialogue with you this summer. We've had a lot of conversations about the various purchases that we've talked about as a group and that we voted on. Um, I'm really glad um, to hear the focus on training and I think there is a lot to recommend in this resolution which is written in such a way that it focuses on training. Um, I'm really personally pleased as everyone here has said with with our department's ongoing commitment to training and of course as you've um, helped us come to understand New Jersey has some of the best trained police who are held to some of the highest standards in the country which gives me a lot of faith in our, our local agencies and, and medicine especially. And I think, as others have said, we should be really proud of the progressive approach to community policing that our accredited agency takes. I've really uh, come to understand really well the philosophy that you lead with at the, at the department. And I thank you for educating me on that this, this summer and, and beyond. I really value the trust that our officers have built in our community. And I value above all the safety of our residents and our officers. So of course, as you know, the council voted unanimously to appropriate $25,000 for the purchase of police equipment. And we recently <clears throat> awarded $14,000 of that for the purchase of body armor, riot helmets, gas masks, canisters, and batons. So I feel confident that our officers will be well outfitted with safety equipment. Um, however, I remain concerned that introducing arrest shields to our agency's civilian response does increase both the perceived threat to community members and the actual threat to our officers. And so because of that, I'm voting no on this purchase because I really care about our officers' safety and I firmly believe that it is safer for police when tensions remain low. We don't want our officers harmed and we don't want to create an, ad an atmosphere of distrust or resentment. We want to continue to build on the trust that our agency has cultivated in the community. And um, I think we're all really proud that Madison views the police as part of our own community and we want our police to continue to show up as one of us when there is a need to serve and protect and not have a wall between um, our community and the officers that, that guard us. Thanks.
Thank you. Any other comments? All right, I will uh, ask for a uh, motion for resolution 245-2020, resolution of the Borough of Madison awarding contract for the purchase of 12 protective shields for the police department. Mayor, I move R245-2020. I'll second. Any further discussion? Roll call vote, please. Mrs. Vitale? Yes. Ms. Bailey? Yes. Ms. Byrne? Yes. Mr. Hoover? So we have a, you need to unmute yourself, Mr. Hoover. He's saying yes, I can't hear, I'm sorry. Yes. Okay, thank you. you Happy yes, thank you. Yes. Ms. Cohen? Yes. Ms. Ehrlich? No. Motion passes. Thank you, Chief. Thank, thank you. I was, I was saying that, but I was muted. Thank you so, so much. Well. Thank you. Chief. Yeah. <laughs> thank yeah. you. Take care. All right. Uh, we are now moving on to ordinance of hearing. Will the clerk please read the statement? Ordinance is scheduled for hearing. We're introduced by title and passed on first reading at a regular meeting of the council held on September the 14th. Uh, 2020. All were posted and filed according to law and copies were made available to the general public requesting same. I call up ordinances for second reading. I ask the clerk to read said ordinance by title. Ordinance 30-2020. Ordinance of the Borough of Madison appropriating $391,673 from the General Capital Improvement Fund for the purchase of a new rescue pumper and firefighting equipment. I open the hearing. Anyone in the public that wishes to comment, please raise your hand by clicking on the hand or hit star nine if you're on the phone. Seeing, nope, we have, we have one comment on uh, this is for ordinance 30-2020. Tom. Uh, I'm not gonna comment on just that, Mayor. I thought we were uh, just- Okay, yeah. Well, we're, the uh, open comment period will be coming shortly. So if it's, unless it's on this ordinance, uh, hold, hold off on your comments. Okay. Okay. Yep. So he's. So we. He. Hearing. Put his hand down, and Tom will be coming back. See, I. I hear. I close the hearing. Okay, Mayor. I move Ordinance Thirty Dash Twenty Twenty. Second. Any council discussion? Roll call vote. This is Vitali. Yes. Miss Bailey. Yes. Miss Byrne. Yes. Mr. Hoover. Yes. Miss Cohen. Yes. Ms. Ehrlich? Yes. I declare ordinance 30-2020 adopted and finally passed and ask the clerk to publish notice there of a new newspaper and file the ordinance with, ordinance with the law. Ordinance 31-2020. Ordinance of the Borough of Madison appropriating $300,000 from the Electric Capital Improvement Fund for the purchase of utility poles, transformers, and additional electric materials. Anyone wishing to comment on ordinance 31-2020, please raise your hand. Seeing none, I close the hearing. Mayor, I move ordinance dash, uh, 31 2020. Second. Any council discussion? Roll we'll call a vote. Mrs. Vitale? Yes. Ms. Bailey? Yes. Ms. Byrne? Yes. Mr. Hoover? Yes. Ms. Cohen? That one? And Ms. Ehrlich? Yes. Yeah, we saw a yes there. We saw a yes. yes. Um, I declare ordinance 31 2020 adopted and finally passed and ask the clerk to publish notice there of the newspaper and file the ordinance according to the law. Ordinance, ordinance 32 2020. Ordinance of the Borough of Madison appropriating $15,228 from the Municipal Open Space Trust Fund for reimbursement of drainage and remediation capital projects at the Museum of Early Trades and Crafts. I open the hearing for ordinance 32-2020. Anyone who wishes to comment, please raise your hand. Seeing none, I close the hearing. Mayor, I move ordinance 32-2020. I'll second. Any council discussion? Roll call vote. Mrs. Vitale? Yes. Ms. Bailey? Yes. Mrs. Byrne? Yes. Mr. Hoover? Yes. Ms. Cohen? Yes. Ms. Rillick? Yes. I declare ordinance 32-2020 adopted and finally passed. I ask the clerk to publish notice there of the newspaper and file the ordinance in accordance with the law. We now move on to our second of two invitations for discussion. This is when you may comment on any topic. Again, uh, 
click the hand to raise your hand. Once you're recognized and unmuted, state your name and address first thing out of your mouth, and then uh, you may state your comments. Please try to keep your comments to three minutes, but we give you a one minute grace period and you'll be asked to stop at four minutes. Tom, welcome back. Hello again, everybody. Thomas Harrell and Pudis, 27 Pomeroy Road. Um, you know, I had a nice agenda of items to discuss with you, and then Jim Burnett threw in this whole COVID financial impact report. So I don't know if four minutes is enough time. We might need to have about 25 minutes more to go over what I want to discuss with you. But I'll, I'll, I'll try to keep it as brief as I can. So Jim, thanks. As usual, very thorough presentation. You are always a very good number cruncher and a forward thinker. And I, and I know you have the borough's best interests in mind. But just some comments as a resident and a homeowner and a business owner in the, in the community. Um, you know, you are very fortunate, I think, that we have been able to keep our uh, tax collection rate stable so far. I think that that uh, that represents that the residents really value the expense of living in the borough and that they know that it's important to take care of <coughs> the taxes so that the community can stay stable. But another um, part of Jim's presentation was about the delay in paying utility bills. And uh, I would surmise that the reason people are paying the utility bills slow is because they're struggling. So uh, we're obviously not going to know <clears throat> if everybody who's paying late is struggling, but we can surmise now that there is a lot of people in our community, in our state, in our country who are struggling. So that is sending a message that everybody has to be much more conscious of how we spend money, how we're going to budget the funds that we're collecting. I saw the reductions in everything. I don't have that slide in front of me to comment on some of the areas where I think there will be a rebound in some of them where that might be the new norm. And we're gonna to have to figure out as a borough how to adjust and manage ourselves without causing any more hardship or increased costs to our residents. Um, another thing I wrote down, some things that you have to consider, and it's not something that's easy to discuss, but there might have to be some some kind of freeze on salaries, new hires, not suggesting a pay cut like a lot of big corporations have done, just something that you need to consider if your budget is gonna struggle. We're all looking inside as residents as what we need to do to be able to, to pay for the lives we live. We do the same in our businesses and the borough has to do the same too. Same thing about your healthcare benefits. I don't know if there's any other plans that can be revised that will save the borough money. I think that we might have to consider Paul, you're shaking your head, Johnny. You no, just, I'm just, no. Okay. okay. No, no, no. Ray's, Ray's listening, right, Ray? I'm there? listening. I see you, my friend. Where's Ray? Okay. Where's Ray? I think we might have to talk about also putting a hold on some of our capital projects. I, I already expressed to you, Mayor, my surprise and displeasure that we repaved the train station parking lot for three cars that park there every day. Um, it might be minutes, Tom. All right. Thanks, Mayor. Uh, it's not really showing me the love, but uh, I'll fit I'll fit in as much as I can. <laughs> so that's one example. I don't know how many raw road projects you have. If it's something that's urgent, like a couple of the resolutions you just passed, you can't really put those to the side without really impacting our quality of life. But you have to look deep inside. One more thing that you should probably consider is reducing the open space and historic preservation tax. At this point, whatever you need to pay your debt obligations, you should collect that. But I don't think you should be collecting any surplus for a while. If, if, there, if we're gonna be suffering from the effects of this pandemic and loss of salaries and people losing uh, jobs and maybe their homes, the last thing that we need to do is collect more taxes for something that's improving recreation. I have a list of other things, Mayor, which are kind of important that I yeah. would just bring up. Which one thing, one thing that you should bring up. Okay, one thing that you should 10 seconds. Listen, the DDC has done a great job finally closing Waverly Place. There's six more events on the agenda for Friday nights. And I would like you to let the community know in whatever way you can 
about what's coming up and they should participate. Okay. Hopefully you'll be there, Mayor, for one of these. Okay, yep. Th thank you, Tom. I'm sorry Ed, we have to have to cut you there. I, I apologize again, we have to be consistent with our time frame, but it's a, a lot of good, good uh, food for thought that uh, you, you have shared here. And uh, the council members have uh, heard that a couple of things just to reinforce with our council members as we go forward is um, as we look at utilities, it's both the usage as Jim pointed out and the payments. I would also uh, say for all our residents and any of our business owners out there that um, are struggling, uh, you know, re reach out to the borough and uh, make sure you are arranging uh, payment plans because we certainly uh, want to make sure you get, you get back on track. And we will, um, you know, again, look at the possibility of if we can provide more aid in that area. Certainly good, good suggestions related, related to the freeze and the hires and that's everything is needs to be on the table. Um, the parking lots, it's, um, you know, one of those uh, catch 22s. Um, we, we took care of it because the parking lots are empty. Um, and certainly when we decided to move forward, we had no idea how we, we knew we were in for an extended time, but uh, you know, we didn't know that this is, it, it, it's gonna be a very extended time, but the parking lots are done. And so when they're back in use again, uh, they are taken care of, but we do need to look at the overall capital investment. And so uh, I think a lot of good suggestions and the, um, the downtown Waverly, um, we have been talking about not only the impact of having that closed, but um, a future capital project is the reconstruction of Waverly Place. And so this is not only a, uh, to stimulate the downtown right now, but it is to experiment with what Waverly Place can be for, our, for the future. So uh, thank you for supporting that. And uh, I will apologize right now that I will not be there for this Friday uh, because I have to go out of town on uh, a family thing. And, uh, but I, you will see me down there on a, a Friday enjoying the music and everything else going on. Anyone else wishing to comment, please raise your hand now. Seeing none, I close this part of the meeting and we move on to introductory ordinances. Will the clerk please read the statement? The ordinance is scheduled for first reading, have a hearing date set for Monday, October the 26th, 2020. All will be published in the Madison Eagle, posted on the bulletin board and made available to members of the public requesting copies. I call up ordinances for first reading, ask the borough clerk to read said, said ordinance by title, ordinance 34-2020. Ordinance of the borough of Madison, amending chapter 59, section 59-15 of the borough code entitled fees regarding dog and cat licenses to increase fees. Mayor, I move ordinance 34-2020. I'll second. And there's some background that uh, Deb shared during a report. Any other further discussion on this? Roll call vote, please. Mrs. Vitale? Yes. Ms. Bailey? Yes. Ms. Byrne? Yes. Mr. Hoover? Yes. Ms. Cohen? Yes. Ms. Ehrlich? Yes. Ordinance 35-2020. Ordinance of the Borough of Madison appropriating up to $150,000 from the Affordable Housing Trust Fund for the construction of two, two family house at 7 Elm Street by Madison, in Madison by HQM Properties. Mayor, I move ordinance 35-2020. Second. Any council discussion? Tom covered this well in his comments earlier, so. Yeah. Roll call vote, please. Mrs. Vitale? Yes. Ms. Bailey? Yes. Ms. Byrne? Yes. Mr. Hoover? Yes. Ms. Cohen? Yes. Ms. Ehrlich? Yes. Ordinance 36-2020. Ordinance of the Borough of Madison appropriating $85,000 from the General Capital Improvement Fund for the purchase and installation of borough-wide wayfinding signs and gateway signage. Uh, Mayor, I move uh, ordinance uh, 36-2020. I'll second. Any council discussion? Roll we'll call a vote. Mrs. Vitale? Yes. Ms. Bailey? Yes. Ms. Byrne? Yes. Mr. Hoover? Yes. Ms. Cohen? Yes. Ms. Hurley? Yes. All right, move on to consent agenda resolutions. Will the clerk please read the statement? Consent agenda resolutions will be enacted with a single motion. Any resolution requiring expenditure supported by a certification of availability of funds. Any resolution requiring discussion will be removed from the consent agenda. All resolutions will be reflected in full in the minutes. 
Mayor, I move uh, resolutions 236-2020 to resolution 244-2020, and then resolution 246-2020 to resolution 249-2020. Second. Any council discussion or any of that need to be pulled? Roll call vote, please. Mrs. Vitale? Yes. Ms. Bailey? Yes. Ms. Byrne? Yes. Mr. Hoover? Yes. Ms. Cohen? Yes. Ms. Ehrlich? Yes. All right, there is no unfinished business. Approval of vouchers. Will the clerk please read the voucher totals? Yes, for the current fund, $4,226,207.54. The general capital fund, $158,446.32. For the electric operating fund, $688,010. Electric capital fund, uh, no expenses. Water operating fund, $28,202.37. And the trust, $36,080.98. The total is $5,136,947.21. Mayor, I uh, move approval of the vouchers. Second. Any discussion? Roll call vote, please. Mrs. Vitale? Yes. Ms. Bailey? Yes. Ms. Byrne? Yes. Mr. Hoover? Yes. Ms. Cohen? Yes. Ms. Ehrlich? Yes. And a new business, I'd like to make the follow, uh, the one uh, appointment requiring council consent is to Helene Cor Corlett to patriotic celebrations for the unexpired term through December 31st, 2020. I'll move it. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And then uh, I'd like to announce the following appointment uh, for an ad hoc committee not requiring uh, council consent. And that is Mark McBride as the uh, uh, Madison Housing Authority representative for our ad hoc committee uh, working on our housing settlement. Um, and that is Mark McBride of Prospect Street. So that is all for new business. Mayor, I move that we adjourn the meeting. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you very much.